Good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I would also like to thank Norad for inviting me and also for supporting a couple of the products that I'm going to show you. So my presentation will have three parts. The first part, the first presentation that I'm going to give you is actually showing all the WHO products, recent products over past couple of years on the topic on health inequality monitoring. So a quick review on all those products. Then the second part of the presentation, I will focus on one specific product, which is that a state of inequality in reproductive maternal and child health that you got the executive summary outside. And I have with myself three copies of full report. So in case you're also interested to get that. And related to that report, my third part of the presentation will be a focus on demonstrating interactive visualization of health inequality data to use as a way, as an effective way to communicating the results to different audiences, including policymakers. Okay? So, I mean, we we'll start with that figure that uh, all of us know that basically uh, averages are not good enough and cannot show the whole situation and basically may induce the wrong action. As nicely shown in that image that if we provide only information about average depth of the river, that may provoke wrong action. So the same is true in population health. And as we know, national averages do not account about within country inequalities. Might be the case that national average of a country in any health indicator may improve, but the situation of health in some groups may be improved in that country, but some other subgroups may see their health deteriorating. So in that sense, it's also important that when we look at health, we look at both, we look at national averages and also situation in each of the subgroups in the country. Uh, we do monitoring and simply it's repeatedly watching the situation to see any change over time. In health, it matters because we can see the health situation in a country has improved or worsened or remained the same. And it also shows that if policies, programs, and practices have reached what they are designed to be achieved or not. We can think of monitoring health in a country as a continuous circle that can be broken down into five steps. So we always start with having a framework where we define the indicators that could capture the situation. Then, of course, we need to obtain the data for those indicators. We need to analyze the data. We need to report the results. And the hope is that by providing that evidence to policymakers and different stakeholders, then we get implementing changes. And because of that, again, the new cycle starts. So the same thing also applies for monitoring health inequality. The only difference is that then each of these components have some specific characteristics regarding monitoring health inequality. Uh, given the importance of monitoring health inequality, uh, WHO has tried to develop several tools to build the capacity for and also to advocate the practice of data disaggregation at global level and at national level. Uh, in the chain of collecting data, analyzing data, and reporting the results. So global health monitoring of inequality, we can think of comparison of within country inequality across countries. So that's what we mean by global monitoring. And that quite matters in international initiatives that we have right now. So for SDG, for universal health coverage, Equity monitoring is hardwired to them. And the principle of data disaggregation is actually a key component for sustainable development. At national level, it's also essential to disaggregate data and look at uh, health inequality monitoring. 
because that guides us to see if policies, programs, and practices at national level are reaching the most disadvantaged groups or not. But that's also, national monitoring is the base also for global monitoring, but goes beyond, so that we can actually look at, understand the determinants, the issues behind disadvantaged groups as well. So I listed uh, several products here that we produced. We are going to, I mean, this table basically shows each product covers which components of monitoring and at which level, global or and national level. So I'm going uh, to have a quick overview on each of these products. So the first one is WHO uh, Global Health Observatory Health Equity Monitor. Uh, that is actually an open platform of disaggregated health data that we launched two years ago, more than two years now. We started actually February 2013, so it's nearly three years. And simply it has at least these three components, has a database, it has country profile, and also some interactive visualization. The database that it has features reproductive, maternal, and child health indicators, and it's actually the largest available disaggregated data in the world that we have in one place. And basically, for that, for developing that database, we reanalyzed more than 250 international household health surveys, mainly DHS, demographic and health survey, and mix multiple indicator cluster surveys that provided us comparable data across 94 countries. Most of them are low and middle income countries. And we established a mechanism to make sure that we can continue and update the system. So it's not just one thing that, that is done once and then it's get out of date. We established a system with University of Pelotas in Brazil to make sure that every time that new surveys comes in, then we get new analysis and we can update the database. So it covers over 35 reproductive, maternal, and child health indicators disaggregated by five dimensions of inequality. Economic status, education, sex, place of residence, and subnational region. Uh, the country profile, that's another feature of that. We provide it for all the countries for which we have the data. And using this country profile, which is interactive, and I'm going to show you quickly later on, we can look at the performance of the country over time for the countries for which we have more than one data point. And also we can compare indicators across different topics of RMNCH. And interactive visualization that you can see online, I'm going to show you part of it later on. So just here to say that all the products that I'm explaining uh, are available online. Also some of the hard copies we provided here that you can see. So that's the book, the report that was published last May uh, on showing global state of inequality in RMNCH topic. Uh, again, that's publicly available and you have hard copies of the executive summary with the CD that provides all the interactive components that it has. I'm going to explain more about this product basically separately later on in the separate presentation. At WHO, we also provide recommendation on how to do global monitoring for health inequality. So basically, how methodologically we can measure health inequality, what are the issues with summary measures, and so on. So one of the, for example, products that we had, we published last year was in a collection in Plus Medicine about universal health coverage. We had one paper to show how equity could be monitored in the context of universal health coverage. Right now, actually, we're providing, we're trying to come up with equity adjustment UHC indicator that actually could be fed into target 3.8 of SDG. 
So we're trying to make sure that we can have equity monitoring also in place in the global agenda. Then it's also important to, to advocate for the practice of health inequality monitoring. And for that reason, and to reach uh, policymakers, senior management, and the people who may not have that much familiar with the idea of health inequality monitoring, we uh, provided a small handbook, a small uh, booklet like that. So as you may see in some of them outside. And here we tried to explain the concepts of health inequality monitoring and data disaggregation in a very simple way using text, figures, uh, graphs, and also some video clips. Uh, so I'm going to show you right now one of the video clips because I also want to have this sort of presentation also a bit different and interactive. So sometimes when it comes to interactivity, it may not work all the time, so we'll, we'll see. So I'm going to shift to the, to the video. Interactive visuals make health data accessible, easy to navigate, and meaningful to diverse audiences. Interactivity can be used to enhance maps, graphs, and even tables. In this example, we will explore some of the features of an interactive graph. Here, we can see data about birth attended by skilled health personnel in 82 low- and middle-income countries. The data are disaggregated by economic status, from the poorest to the richest subgroups in each country. The circles on the graph indicate countries. Each country is shown on the graph by five circles. The blue bands indicate the interquartile range for each subgroup. That's the middle 50% of countries. The orange lines indicate the middle point, the median of data within each subgroup. Clearly, the coverage is much higher in the richest subgroup. Yes, we can see a gradient across all subgroups. The median coverage increases in a stepwise pattern. Let's take a look now at the situation in middle-income countries. It seems the interquartile range gets smaller in richer subgroups. This must mean that the richer subgroup in most countries has high coverage, but there is more of a range among the poorest subgroups. Good observation. Now, let's see the situation in low-income countries. Well, coverage levels are certainly lower in subgroups of the low-income countries. There is still a gradient pattern across the subgroups, but it is much steeper here. We can also filter the view to show countries from a particular region, say, the African region. This reduces the view to 35 countries. The view can easily be further customized to show low-income African countries. And now, can we focus on a specific country, such as Benin? Sure. I'm just clicking in the country list to highlight Benin. It does pretty well next to other low-income African countries. And it still remains above the median, even when we include the low- and middle-income countries from Africa. What about other countries with high coverage in the richest subgroups? What are those countries? Are they always above the median in the other subgroups too? We can answer these questions by drawing a box around the circles at the top of the richest subgroup. There seems to be some variation here. Some countries have more inequality across subgroups than others. That's right. Let's look at Congo and Cameroon, for example. These are two middle-income African countries. Both countries have similarly high coverage in the richest subgroup, but the gradients across the subgroups are very different. In Congo, coverage is fairly high, even in the poorest subgroup. However, in Cameroon, there is a much steeper gradient of inequality. This short demonstration has shown how interactive visuals can enable data exploration. The data used here are the latest available data gathered in international household surveys between 2005 and 2012. Okay. Got it here. 
Okay, uh, let me get back to the presentation again. So the next uh, product that we have is basically the Handbook on Health Inequality Monitoring. That blue book that, unfortunately, I have only three copies with me here, hard copies, but that's also available online for the download. So the idea for that handbook that we published in 2013 was basically to gather all the information regarding the whole cycle of monitoring of health inequality and see the challenges and approaches to each of these components. And to do that, we also use the real data, real example data from countries, from low middle income countries, to show how this concept could be applied in practice. So on top of that, we tried it in one country in Philippines, and the last chapter of the handbook basically shows a step-by-step -step approach that how health inequality monitoring could be implemented in one country. Uh, also, we applied, we used the method uh, using data in reproductive, maternal, and child health in low middle income countries, but the whole methodology could be applied to any settings, to high income countries, or also to lower administration level at provincial level or district level and any other health topics. Uh, so far, the handbook was received quite well across. WHO regions, several regions are trying to translate it to other languages like Arabic, French, and Portuguese. And last year, it was actually nominated as a highly commended uh, book in the uh, public health category by uh, British uh, Medical Association Medical Book Awards. Based on the handbook that what we developed, we uh, produced a series of eight lectures uh, with speaker notes explaining the concept of health inequality monitoring that is publicly available and that's for advanced users who wants to use it and present the idea to the others. So that's one thing that we did. And then last May, we also developed an e-learning module uh, for health inequality monitoring that is based on the handbook again, but the idea here is that we use it as an e-learning format so that it allows users to take their own time and learn health inequality monitoring on the self-paced approach and self-directed way. The whole module, the whole course could be taken in four hours and in the course, I can show you, uh, there are actually CDs outside, and I think I have a CD here with me, this sort of CD that you can take outside that have the, the course, but also that's publicly available on the WHO website, so you can register and use the, the course online. I can show you a little bit of that. So each chapter, so again here we have eight chapters for the course, and each chapter as, I sh as it's shown here has like a slides information about the course followed by quiz questions to just check the retention of that uh, chapter. And more importantly, and the, at the end of each chapter it has application exercise, which are open uh, questions to build the capacities for health inequality monitoring step by step. So basically, whoever is using it can apply it in the program with which they're working or in the country they're living in. So that's the whole point that by doing that, we can implement, incorporate health inequality monitoring in the health programs and uh, also in the country. There are two versions of that available, one version with audio and the other version with no audio for the countries which do not have broadband uh, internet, so that it's smaller and they can use it faster. And what we're doing at 
Country level is basically continuation of capacity building for health inequality monitoring for different components of that, for data analysis, for reporting equity. Last year, uh, I started a new initiative, which is basically combining a training of trainers workshop and regional workshops for health inequality monitoring. And the idea behind is that to build capacities in each region to make sure that not all the burden of capacity build is, uh, building can be handled by WHO. So the whole idea is that before running the workshop, we define a two, three health research institute in each region, and we invite them for that TOT workshop, which is a one-day workshop before a starting regional workshop, and we walk them through the whole course of the workshop. Then they co-facilitate the regional workshop with myself, and then at the end of each day of the regional workshop, we recap, and we have another half a day at the end of regional workshop to make sure that we are in the right uh, way for the workshop. The whole the ultimate idea for that capacity building is that we would like to have a global network of health research institutes for capacity building in the countries and providing technical consultancies to them. But I'm trying to build it little by little given the limitation of resources that we have. So, so far we covered four out of six WHO regions. Actually, I just came back from my last training, which was in Chile, and that's the aim to cover all the regions and make sure that we have a good network of the research institutes. And again, all the information is available in a paper that is outside this paper, and the whole idea is that basically in that paper we tried to explain the scope the contents and application of each of these products that you can see online, and the link to them is available in the paper too. Uh, that's what we are doing basically at global and national level. The whole idea at global level is that we should go beyond reproductive, maternal, and child health data disaggregation. We started with that topic because of comparability of data, availability of comparable data in a large number of countries, but data disaggregation deserves to be done in all health topics. So that's the next move that we need to do at global level. At national level, the whole idea is to make sure that data disaggregation and practice of health inequality monitoring is integrated into health information system. That I will explain later on in the next presentation. So I move to the second part of the presentation, which is more focused on the report that we produced last May, which is basically, this is the full report, and you've seen the executive summary of that outside. So the objective of the report was two things. First, we wanted to produce a comprehensive global report of a state of inequality in this topic, in our arm in CH. And we actually used a sound method of analysis and tried to have a user-oriented reporting to make sure that we can do that communication very well, given the availability of the data that we had in the topic. The second objective was basically to introduce innovative ways for audiences to engage with data, to explore data, and for that reason we integrated different ways of visualizations, like something as so-called uh, story point dashboards that I'm going to walk you through, and interactive maps, interactive tables, and video clips as well. In this specific report, we picked up 23 RMNCH indicators, both covering interventions and health outcomes, disaggregated by four dimensions of inequality, economic status, education, sex, and place of residence. And we picked up 86 low middle income countries for which we had at least one data source since 2005. So we looked at 10 years ago, and we picked up all those countries for which we had data. For a subset of these countries, for 42 countries, 
We had also another survey 10 years prior to the most recent survey so that we could look at change of inequality over time. So we picked up those 42 countries also to look at change of inequality. So the results. Uh, we got two main messages, one disappointing, one actually more hopeful message. The disappointing one we already knew. So inequality exists across most of ARM and CH indicators. That means that basically the situation of health is worse in the most disadvantaged comparing to most advantage. So poorer families, less educated, rural residents have lower health or lower access to interventions comparing to the rest. But the promising point was that actually health inequality narrowed over time. Basically what we see, the improvement in national average is realized more by faster improvement in the situation of most disadvantaged group, which was a good thing. Of course, for both of these findings, there is a variation, and I'm going to show you the variation through interactive visuals, so it's not true in all countries. But the overall picture is like that. So inequalities in health has decreased, at least in the topic of RM and CH, over time. So here are some of the results that I'm going to show you quickly in a static way, and then we move to the interactive visuals. So here, uh, we're looking, we are going to look at some of the indicators. So I start with a skill birth attendance. On the y-axis, we have the range, the coverage range for a skill birth attendance, going from zero to 100. And on the top, we can see dimensions of inequality broken down by different subgroups. The values are shown here are the median coverage. So basically, that's the middle point of all the countries for each country, uh, for each subgroup. So here we have, uh, for skill birth attendance, 86 countries for which we looked at the data. And that shows the median value. So as we can see, there is a great a steep gradient between when we move from poorest to the richest subgroup. The same is true for education. When we move from no education to secondary plus, we can see a gradient move. And there is a large inequality between urban and rural residents in terms of median coverage of a skill birth attendance. A skill birth attendance shown to have the largest inequality within country inequality in all dimensions that we observe. And again, I would like to emphasize that that's the median value. So there is a large also variation in the estimates that we see. So we will look at that later on. So that's the second largest inequality seen in antenatal care coverage at least four visits in the countries. So again, we can see a large gradient for economic status, for education, and a large difference between rural and urban area in terms of median coverage of antenatal care for visits plus. But in some indicators, also we could see inequality that hasn't been that large. So here we looked at DTP3 immunization coverage, again, we can see there is a gradient still, but it's not that steep. The same is true here. So we can see the inequality, but not as much as we've seen before. And in some indicators like BCG vaccination coverage, you can see we see really minimal inequality on the median coverage. So in all the subgroups, we can see they're reaching to highest coverage. This is intervention coverage. Let's look at health outcomes. See what was the inequality in health outcomes. So here we're looking at under five mortality rate, again median value. And here what, of course, what we would like to see, we would like to see lower under five mortality, opposite to the intervention coverage. And here we could see the reverse pattern as we expected. We can see as we go from poorer families, two richer families, then under five mortality decreases and there is a gradient. The same is true for education 
And we can see the differences between urban rural area and between males and females. The same is true also for childhood uh, chronic malnutrition uh, as measured by stunting in children. So the same pattern you can see easily here. So that's about latest status of inequality and that issue that we saw as like more disappointing message. So let's see some examples about the hopeful message. So change over time and how it's changed in different subgroups. To start with that, I'm going to give you just one quick example to just explain the concepts by which we measured inequality over time. So what we would like to see overall is that we would like to see the improvement in the disadvantaged group should be faster comparing to the advantage group. Or at least it, sh it should have the same pace as advantage group. So that's what we want to see. So let's see how it works. Let's see if we look at change over time, in our case over 10 years. In that hypothetical example, if the intervention coverage increased, improved 30 percentage points in the disadvantaged group, and also 30 percentage point in the advantage group. So the difference between the two is zero. And this is what we call excess change. So excess change in the disadvantage group comparing to the advantage group. It's simply subtracting the value in the advantage group from disadvantage group. So that's one situation which is not bad, but is not ideal. The other situation is this one. So we can see improvement in both cases, and improvement is faster, it's bigger, larger in the disadvantaged group comparing to the uh, advantage group. And here, when we calculate excess change, we can see that's positive, that's 20 percentage point faster improvement in the disadvantaged comparing to the advantage. That's the ideal situation that we would like to see if we would like to narrow the gap over time. Oops, sorry. And the third one is the least desirable situation. It might be, I mean, it's not really the least desirable, it might be even worse, but the third scenario could be like that, that both most disadvantaged and least disadvantaged has improved in intervention, but intervention, but improvement was faster in the advantage group. That's what we see normally with the traditional programs. When there is any traditional programs in place, it's not equity oriented, it usually reaches the most advantaged group. So this is what we see. And definitely then what happens with initiating a new traditional program, we will see the gap increases. So these are the theoretical part. What happened in reality? In that 42 countries for which we looked at time trend data, four indicators for which we looked at, that's the situation. That's the promising part. For all the indicators that you can see here, family planning, antenatal care, four visits, skill birth attendance, DTP3, immunization, care seeking for children with suspected pneumonia, and also we created a composite coverage index which combines all these interventions together we can see actually the improvement over time was faster in the disadvantaged group comparing to the advantage group. Again, that's the median value. And situation varied from one country to another one. But overall, that was positive. Most countries showed that improvement was faster in the disadvantage comparing to the advantage. For example, in immunization coverage, we can see uh, that's looking at poorest and richest. The improvement in the poorest was nine percentage point faster than richest quintile. So which was a good thing actually, and you can see it in many countries. In terms of, oops, it goes very quickly. In terms of education also, that was the case. For all the indicators, we could see the improvement in the no education group was faster comparing to secondary plus educated group. And people living in rural area had faster improvement than urban area. So that was 
that second message that was quite hopeful that what we got in the change over time analysis. Okay, let's look at some interactive visualization right now. So I'm going to change the view to the interactive visualization that we have. Uh, I know that I tried it from the back and that's not very well seen. So if, if you really want to see anything, you have to come closer. But anyhow, as I understand, that's going to be filmed and then you can see the whole thing later on. And all of these visualizations also are publicly available on the WHO website. So you're welcome to take your time and freely explore data. But let's just start one of them and see the concept. So what we want to say with that. So here, that's the starting page. We can choose between indicators, health interventions that we have here, and we can look at also any dimensions of inequality. <coughs> so any combination can be chosen. And I'm picking up DTP3 immunization coverage by economic status to see what's the whole idea. And here we want to tell a story about a state of inequality in DTP3 immunization coverage. So when I click here, we start that story point dashboard. And as you can see here on the top, we have different stories that we can talk about inequality in DTP3 coverage. And we start with the first story on the top, which says, I will read that because, I mean, even I can't read it from here, it says inequality exists across countries. That's the first story. And what we see here, we can see countries. Here are countries. Countries are shown as a horizontal bar chart, as you can see here. And the coverage of DTP3 immunization coverage is shown on the x-axis from 0 to 100%. So when I scroll down, then you can see the coverage decreases. That's ordered in that way. And of course, we can change the ordering by this thing that's here. So you can change the order. You can order them alphabetically by the name of the countries. So you can pick up any countries that you want. There is also this line, orange line, or it's a vertical line. That's the median value for all the countries for which we have data here. So the median value is about, is nearly 80% meaning that at least four out of five children got immunization, DTP3 immunization, in half of those countries. So that's what median value means for us. Then, of course, we have the left menu here, left panel, from which we can choose which indicator we would like to look at data. And we can filter the data by middle-income countries, for example, versus low-income countries. And as you can see here, when I do that, then the median line changes. And I can also pick up any region. I can pick up African region or American region to see different values here. There are also some tabs here that provides what you see in each of the visual, how to explore each visual, and if there is any technical notes in terms of data analysis, then we will see here. So what's the story here? The story here is that, as we can see, there is large variation across countries. The coverage gets 97% in Rwanda. And that's another feature. If I want to get more information about any single country, I can hover on the bar, and I can get the value for the estimate, and I can get the confidence interval. So it's also, it has multiple aim, it's also good for researchers if they want to write a paper and look at basically the statistical differences between uh, countries that they can see. So it will be like nearly 100%, and in some countries like Somalia, it's only 14% coverage. So that's the first story. And then I go to the second story, which says, but inequality also exists within countries. So I'm going to the second story. So we're seeing the same visual. That's exactly the same. List of the countries in the same order, ordered by their national average. But here, 
we're disaggregating data by wealth quintile. So here, as I scroll down, you can see it clearly that for each country, when we look at, look at the country horizontally, you can see five circles, and each circle represents one wealth quintile for that country. So here we can see within country inequalities in countries. And for some countries, for example, if I pick up Pakistan here, you can see there is large inequality within countries. In the richest quintile, as we can see, it has 88% coverage of children immunized. So it's already passed the target that we had for universal health coverage, for example, is going beyond 80%. But when we look at the poorest family, it's only 30%, so less than 1% of children immunized in Pakistan. So that's the way that we can look at disaggregated data. If I can click here, yeah. So basically, I'm just showing here the variation, the range that you can see within each country in terms of inequality. Of course, I can also change here from economic status to education, and you can see the vari variation across education group in each country for DTP3 immunization coverage, for place of residence between urban rural area, and even when I look at sex, in most of the countries, as we know, there is no inequality or minimal inequality between boys and girls, but there are some countries that we can see some variation here. So that's, that's the importance of disaggregating data to see any specific patterns that we can see. The other point that I would like to mention in this visual is that that variation, as you can see, may differ from one country to another one. I'm just picking up here uh, Bolivia and Cambodia, and they are next to each other, meaning that the national average are the same. Both of them have 85% national average of DTP3 immunization coverage, but, that, but as you can see, for Cambodia, there is relatively large inequality between poorest and richest. It's about 20 percentage point difference, but there is no inequality for Bolivia. So that's also the variation that you can see. I'm moving to, I'm not going, of course, to show you all these stories. I'm picking up a couple others to just make some points. I'm moving to a story point four, and this is very similar to what you've seen in the video. So that makes my life easier. I don't need to explain every part of that, but just a quick recap. Again, we can see here country list, but on the top we can see uh, subgroups, economic status broken down to five quintiles. And then, again, for each country, we have five circles representing five quintiles. For example, what's the advantage of showing this sort of data? Again, a quick recap, that line that you see here, that horizontal line, is the median line. So that's the midpoint of coverage within each subgroup, within each quintile. And that gray band, I don't know if you can see it from the back, that's the interquartile range. That's middle 50% of countries. That's summary measure to show the dispersion. So what's the advantage of this sort of visualization? I can pick up any country, for example, if I pick up uh, Egypt. So I can see for Egypt, that's actually doing quite good because there is no inequality between poorest and richest. You can see any gradient. All the wealth quintiles have already reached or getting close to 100%. And this sort of visualization is good for benchmarking, for comparing one country to the others to see where that country sits. And here I can see actually Egypt is doing quite well comparing to the other low and middle income countries. So that's, that's a good advantage. So if I pick up, for example, low income countries, and I had one good example, which was uh, if I can find here, Cameroon. Okay, let me get back to the full view so that I can see that. 
For Cameroon, you can see there is a large inequality between poorest and richest. And using this view in the benchmarking, actually we can see that poorer quintile, the poorest quintile is doing quite bad comparing to other countries. It's below the median, below the even lower band of interquartile range. But its richest quintile is doing not bad. It's along with the median level. So that's sort of the way to look at, to put a country in the context of other similar countries to see what the situation is. I'm moving from latest status, just showing you one visual related to change over time. So how we can tell a story about change over time. So that's the story points number seven. And you can see lots of lines here. So that's basically the same view. You can see countries, you can see quintiles. But the difference here is that for each subgroup, for each quintile, we have two surveys. We have two data points. So the most recent survey here has shown survey two. And another survey going 10 years before, shown as survey one. So then within each subgroup, we have two data points connected with each other with one line. So then in that case, for each country, we have five lines showing five quintiles. And all lines are color coded showing the improvement or not improvement. So I click here. If I click on the improvement, and then on the no improvement, I can easily see in most of the countries, most of the quintiles, we've seen improvements. So they are much more blue lines than red lines. So let's pick up our previous example, Cameroon. And you see here the problem. So what happened in Cameroon between the 10 years, so what was the program was in place, what was sort of intervention that was in place, that couldn't reach the poorest population. And actually, it made inequality increase. So here we can see all the, all the quintiles except the poorest quintiles improved in the DTP3 immunization coverage. And the improvement actually was quite high in the poorer, in the richest subgroups. But the poorest quintile decreased in terms of coverage. So that's, again, another point of monitoring health inequality data. That makes us think, that makes us come up with hypothesis to find the reasons to do research, further research, quantitative or qualitative research to find out what's happening there. So that's the importance of any monitoring system to give us the warning to, to just see what are the issues where inequality exists. I can pick up another example to show that. Actually, the point here is that if you look at Cameroon at national level data, you can see national average of DTP3 immunization coverage improved over time. So that's the point that we should go beyond national average. Because if we just look at national average, we can see improvement. But when it's broken down to the wealth quintiles, we can see the situation is not the same for us, for everything. So let me capture this country, Bolivia. And here you can see that program was definitely equity oriented. Because what has happened here is that there is a huge improvement in the poorer quintiles. And then what happened in the beginning, in 1998, there was a huge gap between this and this. But that program, which was equity oriented, actually make a big increase for all the subgroups so that in 2008, we can see any inequality in the TP3 immunization coverage. So that's my uh, quick summary in that view. There are other visualizations <coughs> that I'm not going to walk you through, just to show you very quickly. And one is country profile. That's the one that I'm going to show you very quickly. 
So these are country profiles, and that's quite good in the sense that you can easily quickly get a sense that what's happening in the country, how country is performing, and what are the programs, different programs in that country. So in the country profile, we can look at one country, but many indicators. And this example is Bangladesh. And of course, in the left panel, you have many options to choose. What I'm going to focus on is basically uh, two topics, maternal health and uh, child health interventions. So the first part, this part is maternal health. And I pick up, let's say, just skillbirth attendance. So what we see here, oops, sorry. That's a skillbirth attendance. And you can see number of years, so we have seven surveys in Bangladesh. So that's the older one. Moving up, we get to the more recent survey. So moving up, we can see time trend. And here in this scale, that's the coverage of indicators from 0 to 100. So going to the right means better coverage. So then what we see here is that over time, the coverage especially in the richest quintile, has improved a lot. So suddenly you can see a big difference between richest quintile and the rest. And in the last period, then the second richest managed to somehow catch. But what happened here is that we don't see that much improvement for the poorest quintile. So that more or less remains the same. And inequality so far then increased over time. But there is also a good story here. If we look at, for example, immunization coverage, I'm picking up measles immunization coverage. There was some sort of inequality here, and it was increased. But for whatever reason, and it could be just running a national campaign to reach the poorest family, then the gap decreased. Because somehow, they were managed to reach the poorer households. So that's also important. When we look at country profile, we can see for different health topics, there might be different policies, different programs in place. Some of the programs, like this one for immunization, definitely is equity oriented. It could reach poor households. For some of the programs, like maternal health, is not working. And of course, when you dig into that, you can explain that for maternal health, you need infrastructures, you need skilled uh, human resources. So that's a big investment for the rural area, for the poorer family, and that may explain it that way. But all those things come after you see these sort of results, and then you start thinking, how can I research about that? So that's the country profile. And the last part of the interactive visual is that, uh, of course, all of us know that tables are boring. It's lots of numbers, yeah? But also, they are quite valuable because you can see lots of information, very precise numbers, and we have to use them. So we can combine, actually, that precise and comprehensiveness of information in tables with interactivity to make it nicer. So I'm just going to show you just one of them very quickly. So that's, again, uh, interactive tables. As you can see, I hover on that, and you can see lots of information. And it's color-coded. So in this way, that shows a table by indicator. So here is antenatal care coverage, at least four visits. And of course, I can pick up any indicator, any dimension from here. And that's color-coded in the sense that you can see uh, if the coverage is lower than 25%, is uh, dark red. So it's already alarming. If the coverage is more than 75%, that's dark blue. So in that sense, you can easily scan the data. You can quickly see how each country is doing in terms of data disaggregation using tables very quickly. So that could be very quick. So you can see in Bangladesh, that's the situation comparing to the other countries. It's more red. And if I change the indicator, if I go, for example, to antenatal, care one visit, I can see suddenly it gets more blue for all the countries, showing me that the situation for antenatal care one visits is 
much better comparing to the four visits. And I can hover on each of these cells, then I can get more information about that specific cell. The confidence interval for my estimates to see also the population at risk that my measure is based on and see that country is from which region, which country income group. So this sort of information also can be communicated using interactive tables as well. So discussing about that, that I'm going to get back to my presentation and finish with just a few messages. And we have the same thing with maps. So I didn't show you the interactive maps. But we have also interactive maps on, the, on our website. So you can, again, feel free to play with, with maps. So then, given this whole discussion, basically, what we would like to say is that health inequality monitoring uh, should be an integral part of any policies, programs, and policies that would like to evaluate the situation in the most disadvantaged group. So this way we can look at and evaluate the programs. And then by having a warning system like that, that helps us to say where inequality exists and then make some further research about that. The Ideal situation that we really seek for is that our national average should improve, but at the same time, that improvement should be realized by faster improvement in the most disadvantaged group, as the example that I showed. So that's one message. The other message is that, and because I'm also coming from that, I mean, my background is on data and I'm partly in the Health Statistics Department, so we advocate for having a strong health information system in countries, and that's the ultimate goal. But adding to that, those health information systems should be equity-oriented. So that's the message. So they should be able to collect, analyze, and report health inequality data. And by collection data, we mean that regularly health information systems should do data collection. And those data should be collected for both health indicators and dimensions of inequality, so that we can look at health inequality. Data could be gathered in one data source, or different data sources could be linked together. For data analysis, country needs to, need to build capacities for that to make sure that they are able to have regular equity analysis of health data, and they have enough knowledge and expertise for that. And for data reporting, given that how cumbersome is the communication of health inequality data, we should be able to have clear messages about the state of inequality that actually has a good balance between being easily understood but also are enough uh, rigorous and quite accurate. And my last slide is that um, equity has gained a lot recently, given the current initiatives, SDGs, UHCs. And now it's the time to basically, we need to take the opportunity for health inequality monitoring. As we see for SDG, uh, the main focus, the main principle is no one should left behind. We have SDG 10 that calls for inequality, both reducing inequality, both for between and within country inequalities. The goal for health is actually promoting well-being and maximizing life expectancy for all at all ages, and we have uh, target 17, 18 in the SDG that actually calls for disaggregating data for all SDG indicators by all relevant dimensions of inequality. On a, in the other hand, universal health coverage, equity is part of universal uh, cover, health coverage. And the way that we think about equity orientation of progressive realiz realization of uh, UHC is basically making sure that that progress happens earlier and faster in the most disadvantaged group. 
So in conclusion, uh, given uh, the importance of equity and also health inequality monitoring that is essential for all health topics and in all countries, that report that we just published a few months ago on a state of inequality in RMNCH is just a starting point for the whole work that should be done for monitoring health inequality in other topics as well. Thank you.